Every week we do a Q&A with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community to find how they persevered, how they innovated, how they built communities, and how they found solutions. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast, where we talk with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community. Today, we're going to talk to John Register, who is a silver medalist in the Paralympics, two-time sport Paralympian, also prior to that, a two-time Olympic trials qualifier. John, we're going to have to talk about that because 110 and 400 meter hurdles are vastly different races. Uh, he was a combat veteran, combat army veteran, amputee, founder of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee's now defunct Paralympic military sport program. Uh, he's also a big time speaker. So we'll talk to him a little bit about that. But John, thank you very much for joining us. Chris, happy to talk to your audience. It's really great to see you again, my friend. So thank you for having me on. This is awesome. I mean, it's great to great to get to see you. We've obviously been in you know, in each other's world, as far as competition, as far as speaking, as far as a variety of different things, we seem to run into each other in a variety of different places, which is really fun. Can I, can I get the the 110 hurdles and the 410 hurdles? Because you were, you were a four-time All-American in college in a bunch of different events. It wasn't like you were just a one-time guy, but 110-meter hurdles and then 400 meter hurdles, like, does anybody do that? Well, there are a few people who do it. Uh, and some folks will do it at the highest level. I mean, we just looked at the last Olympic game, Sydney McLaughlin. One of the things that her coach did, uh, who's had an Olympian in every single game since 1984, that being Bobby Kersey, of course, uh, she ran both. And so what she did was in the 100 hurdles, it's a faster race. And that got her the foot speed that she was looking for for the 400 meter hurdles. I was not doing it like Sydney, of course. The reason I ran the 110 high hurdles was that was my event I won, um, uh, or or was we had had an All American in one my All American honors. And then when I was in the military on the military support program, I came back from Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm without a scratch. I wound up switching to the 400 meter hurdles because I was no longer able to have the rhythm for the 110 meter high hurdles so that's what i really shifted and in my uh fifth race ever i qualified for the olympic standard in my sixth race i finished 17th in the uh the the, the olympic trials uh so i said i'm gonna give another four years and usa track and field news actually in 1994 it picked me as the one to watch for the 1996 olympic games because my times were coming down as the great edwin moses said just like his trajectory path so it looked like I was going to have a good shot at making the 1996 Olympic team in the 400 meter hurdles. Wow. I mean, Sydney McLaughlin, Edwin Moses, you're, you're bringing in some pretty decent names as far as 400 meter hurdles. That's for sure. They're, they're pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard of both of those people. Uh, they they seem to be fairly successful at what they did. Pretty amazing. Uh, so how did it work? So you you went to you went into the Army and then you were in the Army training program the elite training program was that post-college was was that some of your thought beforehand that you were going to get into that, that it was a good way to do your training right because then you know it's probably a way where you're actually getting paid to effectively train as opposed to kind of being on your own and trying to figure out how you're going to pay a coach, how you're going to make ends meet, right? Yeah, that's actually correct, Chris. And so it wasn't a strategy. So let me, I'll be very clear about that. It was, I was walking through the uh, mall one day. I was contemplating whether I was going to go into radio, television, program production. I had a job offer in, in, uh, in, in Mississippi uh, for a local NBC affiliate. Uh, and they had picked me up because I did a really good job in college beneath communications, and I was going to go off in that direction. But I still had this, you know, bug to, to run the Olympic trials. I had seen, you know, the great Michael Conley, who was on, I was on his team for track and field, and he, I saw a lot of Olympians from, uh, you know, Frank Omar was on the Arkansas Razorback track and field team. So it was just all around me, and when you have people around you who elevate at such a level, it, it, it gets ingrained with inside of you. It becomes a part of your ecosystem. So I was wanting to 
tried my best at, at doing the shot and I knew what it took to, to make it because I saw others in my, in my uh, ecosystem doing it. So I joined the military primarily because they had an Army's world-class athlete program. And this program at that time allowed a soldier athlete to train uh, two years for the Olympic Games in their sport, their discipline, as long as the national governing body of the sport, or NGB, said that they were a viable candidate uh, to do so. Uh, later on, we can talk about later, when I started on Paralympic side and after the Paralympic things were uh, kind of um, solid when building the military sport program, I also opened that aperture up so that Paralympic athletes now could remain on active duty uh, if they were injured in the military and they would become part of the Army's world-class athlete program for para athletes. So now that world-class athlete program has Olympic class athletes and Paralympic athletes. And so we can talk about how that all came about as well. No, it's super interesting. How did you, when, when you were doing it, when you were going through the whole program, did you actually go, because you, act, you were active duty, so were you training or were you in Iraq? Were you, how, how, does, how does that balance end up working as an elite athlete? Yeah, sure. Great question. So the Army's world-class athlete program comes to special services, the old special services that, they, that the Army had back during the Vietnam War, during the Korean War. So if athletes ever got, you know, called up to duty, they sometimes would put them in special services so they continue their sport. So this is an offshoot of the Army, Army tra all Army programs, which had boxing, wrestling, uh, you know, now Taekwondo and, and track and field. So how it works is that once the uh, national governing body of sports says that this athlete can is a viable candidate to make the Olympic team, they are then shifted and their duty actually becomes to train. They still have to keep their proficiencies up and everything and, and their, you know, weapons qualification and, and training. But they, they, their, their job responsibility is to train. I was on my way to uh, to uh, to um uh, to the Army's World Class Athlete Program training. I was going to train in in California, and I was living in Virginia. And that's when Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm came up. So my training actually got disrupted to go to the theater to fight for the United States during Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. And so I was diverted. I was probably over there for a little shy of six months. And when I came back. You know, it was really difficult to run those hurdles again because and I was down to about 13.45, 13.5, which is really starting to get a half a second, half a second lower. And you're probably making the, the team probably in the medal hunt. Uh, and that takes a long time to get there. I want to, I want to, you know, be you know, very cautious about saying it. it's easy to get a half a second. It is not. Uh, but switching to the 400 meter hurdles, I had a, had a good shot because I ran a, a, a 400 meters in 45 seconds on an indoor track and my coach said, let's switch to that because at least you can run a 400 and I think you can, you can make it since you know, already know how to hurdle. Interesting. Yeah. And so your, your accident, I mean, I tell people, I feel like I tell people about your accident all the time. I don't think I do it justice. I mean, it sounds like one of the most random and, 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 and just catastrophic things that could possibly happen at a time when you just didn't expect it. Can you, can you tell us what, what happened? Because I don't think I do it correctly. Oh, I'm sure you do it justice. You're on TV, man. You, you, get, you get the story, right? Um, the, what, what happened, Chris, is uh, I was trained for my third Olympic trials. I was in Hayes, Kansas. I was on the all army track and field team. I was trying to get to the world-class athlete program team again. Uh, I had just run my first sub 50 second hurdle race. I was on my training trajectory. Uh, and that's when Edwin Moses said, yeah, you're on, you're on target. You're on path uh, to, to do it. And I figured if I could improve my time about a half a second every year, I would at least give myself a shot to make the, uh, the 1996 Olympic team and, and several others believed I could do it as well. Uh, so, but the wind's blowing hard in Hayes, Kansas that day, and I'm having trouble with my steps. So I'm getting an, an odd number of steps, which means my right leg in this case would lead and an even number of steps, which means my left leg will lead. So I'm a 13 step hurdler and I usually go off my hurdle with my right leg leading first. I can switch to my left leg if I, if I need to. I'm a little bit ambidextrous. And with the wind blowing, I just wanted some consistency because I was in race mode. You don't want to bail out on hurdles when you're in race mode because that might happen to you the next day. You don't want to put anything in that might cause... Um, you to divert from, from it. You want to keep your training consistent. And so I went on, I did my last proverbial pass. I hit the, the, the first one was great. You know, right leg was leading. 
Second hurdle is great. Right leg's leading. I'm, I'm approaching these hurdles at 8.7 meters per second, right on target at 19 and a half miles an hour. Uh, and then I went to the third hurdle. I felt the Kansas wind push against me, but I pushed back against that Kansas wind. And when I jump, I, I realized I'm going to be short and have to take the hurdle with my left leg. I jump off the right leg. I go across the hurdle with my left leg. And when I land, I hear, and then my body sails and it's kind of twists in the air. And I see my left shin pass in front of my face. And my shoulders hit the ground. I bounce to a halt. When I do a once over my body, I, my shoulders are okay. My waist is okay. When I see my knee, the patella has risen about three inches up my femur bone. The left leg is now canted across my right. My foot touching the black surface of the track in Hayes, Kansas. Uh, and that was that was it. And then the pain just began to set in. Um, you know, that, that split second, that split moment before the pain comes in, you're kind of in bewilderment. And then when it comes, it was just like the worst pain I had ever, well, I, I would say the second worst pain I've ever been in. So that was the injury. And so a lot of things came out from it. And it wasn't, many people think that was the devastating part about, um, about my life, right? It took me a long time to understand that that really wasn't, and even the amputation wasn't the hardest part of the story. And so we might talk about that, but uh, I think what we think what happens to us, we're, it's, what comes out of us during our time of testing is what's revealed of who we are. It reveals our character. We don't get character in the test. We, we have some character before the test. We think we know who we're going to be when the test happens. We think we know how we will show up when a test happens, but we really don't know until the test actually happens. And maybe we show up great. Maybe we show up not so great. And then we can learn afterwards. But in the test, the real character is coming out during that time. That's, I mean, we see we see our true selves oftentimes in crisis, really, is what it comes down right. to. And this was this was crisis. Was it crisis right there on the track? I mean, your 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 leg hyperextended. Did you, you know, were you worried about, I mean, like internal bleeding? these kinds of things. It was not your femoral artery. I always thought that it was your femoral artery that was the issue, but it wasn't your femoral artery, right? It was, it was, a, it was a popliteal artery. So it runs right behind the, the kneecap. Um, so that's the artery that was blocked. Uh, no, I, the, the first thing, you know, because I was military, when trauma happens, we train for this stuff all the time. And you just don't know what's going to come out, you know, during time of testing. So what came out for me was, okay, I'm thirsty, but don't give me water because that might induce shock. So that's what I was thinking. Uh, the first words out of my mouth, the first word out of my mouth, uh, eyewitness accounts, I do not remember this, but you know, three or four people have told me since, was the word hallelujah. And so I've been teaching these Bible studies for like six years on the all army track and field team. And in that moment, the person who I thought I may be actually was showing up in that time. I don't remember it, like I said, but other people were, were, were talking about that. And then the thirdly was, I wasn't thinking too far down the road. I, I thought about only one other thing, and that was get my wife. Here's her telephone number. So those are three accounts of what I did immediately when the accident happened. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of getting my wits about me in, in this tremendous pain. Right, exactly. I mean, it, there is a protocol. And as you said, you as an Army person were preparing for the battlefield. I mean, in addition to being an athlete. So this is the the battlefield protocol that you happen to be administering to yourself while you're on the track you had not anticipated that kind of a scenario obviously but you're you're prepared for whatever's going wrong in the trials and tribulations part of being an athlete as well is is sort of seeking out trials and tribulations it's part of how you get better what happened there because because there's a there's a short period of time 18 months where you went from lying on the track, making sure that they're going to contact your wife, to competing actually in Atlanta in 1996. Yeah. <laughs> How did that happen? There's a little. There's a little bit to unpack there, Chris. <laughs> there's a little bit there, I think. Yes, there's exactly. a little bit. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> yeah. So. The doctor, it, it took, the reason I, I, I believe the injury, the injury turned into an amputation and I would have been better off on the battlefield because I've been triaged faster 
was because Hayes, Kansas is not the largest community in the world, right? Uh, and I, it took a long time for the ambulance to come and, and get me triage and my, my, new, my knee reduced. And when they reduced the knee and put it back in place, they, they still, the doctors still didn't have a, a pulse on my big toe through the, you know, their Doppler. Um, so they medevaced me to Wichita, Kansas, where I underwent a 13 hour vein graft operation to try to take a, a vein from my right leg and then invert it into my left leg so it would be uh, a, an artery. So the, 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 the arterial blood flow could start going down through that vein. Um, it just didn't work adequately enough. So it worked a little bit, it didn't work enough. I was gonna be left with either a fused leg or you know, I wasn't gonna bend but like 10, 10, 10 centimeters or something, I think the doctors told me. Or I could take door number two is Dr. Randy Mullins. I remember his name and when he came in to give me the news, he said, you can either keep your leg and use a walker or a wheelchair for the rest of your life or I can amputate your leg and you can use a prosthesis for the rest of your life. I'm like, oh, okay, that's the choice. And it really wasn't a matter of either the wheelchair or the walker. I wasn't thinking about myself in the context of what might be next. I was thinking in the immediate, the right now. And in the immediate right now, it was so painful, I just wanted to get rid of the leg because my male deductive reasoning said if I get rid of my leg, I'll get rid of my pain. And so I looked at that Dr. Mullins with my wife around me, my, my mom there, my, my son, and said, I, I know it has to be amputated. And then he immediately went into work. And two nights later, I woke up and <laughs> I, first I was in more pain than my male deductive reasoning had reasoned. <laughs> And I just wanted, you know, something to knock it out. And I saw a morphine drip button on the on one side. I was too weak to roll over to depress that button. I saw the nurse's aid station outside my door, but those tubes that had been down my throat made the sound too inaudible to get their attention. So there I lay in that bed for the next eight hours with my dangerous thoughts. I mean, who am I now? What's my identity? Is my wife going to stick around? Is my son still going to see me as his father? Do I still have a job in the military? Can I support my family? I mean, my Olympic dreams are over. And at eight o'clock, Dr. Mullins, he comes back in the rooms. He sees I've done a 180 degree shift. He immediately calls my wife, Alice, who's at the local hotel trying to manage me, herself, her mother-in-law, John Jr. And because we're geographically separated, I was stationed in Germany without command sponsorship, meaning I couldn't bring my family with me. She was back home living in uh, West Memphis area of Arkansas, working a job. And that job at seven o'clock that morning, had called to fire her because she had been gone too long taking care of me. And this saint of a woman came over and it took her 45 minutes, her and the doctor to get me out of the bed into a wheelchair, wheeled out to an inaccessible playground where I was parked in that chair, forced to watch my wife and my son play on the swings. It's the first time in my life I felt disabled. I lost it. I started crying uncontrollably. Couldn't even catch a breath. Breathing, heaving sobs, I couldn't catch the breath. And Alice saw me struggling with tears just flowing and streaming out of my eyes. She comes running over. She says, what is going on, John? And I began to articulate to her all my fears I had the night before. And then she said the words that stopped my downward spiral. She said, you know what, John, we're going to get through this together. It's just our new normal. And when she spoke those words, she based on my entire existence. And I started kind of wiping those tears away from my eyes. John Jr. jumps off the swing set, hits the ground, comes running over and says, hey, mom, dad, you see my big jump? Mom, dad, you see my big jump? And he jumped in between Alice and myself. And I realized in that moment, he had just validated me as his father. And he had just created his new normal. So before we get to the 18 months of that, what I overcame is not what most people think I overcame because had I overcome the amputation of my left leg, I would have my leg back and I don't. So what I overcame was my mindset. What overcame was the stigma that other people placed on me that I was believing to think I was less than to make me think that Alice would, might even leave me. That's not on her. That's on me. Because it's not her leaving, it's, it's me asking myself the question, the deeper question, am I still desirable? Do I still have value? Do I still belong? And those questions we begin to ask ourselves over and over again with other people or, or society, and we have to get through it because there are some people who are closest to us that can hold us back, well-meaning, well-intended, but we're in such a frail condition 
that any slight misstep, miswrong word will derail us and maybe hold us back from what we can are truly designed to do. Back to you. Yeah, and the thing is, I mean, certainly kudos to Alice, right, who has who has the global perspective to say, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get through it together. This is this is how this stuff works. You didn't have the clarity of mind in some ways. I mean, you're you're separated from you also didn't know anything about the about like what might be possible. Like you happen to get to the Paralympics 18 months later, but I assume, and tell me if I'm wrong, that you didn't know anything about the Paralympics when you had your leg amputated. You weren't seeing, it's not, it wasn't as prevalent back in 1996, or this might've been 1995 still, to, uh, to, to, to say, okay, well, there is an outlet for me. So the first step for you was was this mind shift of like okay now it's the job in front of me it's it's i have to get better i don't have to worry about the global stuff at the moment i have to get better so how did that work from that moment in the hospital to then saying i'm going to get better and then eventually getting discharged from the hospital and i'd imagine there was probably another another question once you got discharged from the hospital of like where do I go from here? How did how did that progression work? Yeah, I think these are the tougher questions when we have to answer them because a lot of times we just jump, you know, as you know, myself and other athletes would just jump to the kind of what would happen later. And the, the hard part was understanding that I had changed and I couldn't do what I was designed to do for the like for military service. So I had a general officer call me in the hospital, General uh, uh, Gordon Sullivan, who's chief of staff. And I served under one of his generals uh, in Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, General Fred Franks, who was also an amputee. So my second call was from an amputee general in the army, kind of just, you know, said, pick me up and said, you know, uh, let's charge forward, soldier. So that was, you know, I had some really great support from the, from the military. And General Frank said, call me when you make a decision of what you would like to do. And I thought about it long and hard, but I said, I can't go back into battle the same way uh, I and have my buddies back in battle pre prior to when I lost my, when I had the, the amputation. I couldn't trust my equipment to trust it to get somebody else out of the, the firefight. So if I'm non-deployable, I don't want to be in because I'm, I'm always going to be holding somebody else back. So I decided that was my decision to get out. Um, and I, and at that time I, I started working for the army's world-class athlete program in Washington, DC as a sports specialist, a sports administrator for it. So I began learning all these other things and, um, and I got some of the athletes that I was, so, so I managed the careers of the military career and the sports career of the non-combat sports for the United States army. So those individuals that were trying to make the, the Olympic team, I became like their agent. That's uh, for you know. That's what people probably understand out there. I became like a sports agent for the military, and I put a program and, and some and, and some procedures in place. And because of that, a lot of those procedures are still in place for the world class athlete program because I had been around high performance athletics, uh, and I and and I had some really strong acumen with it. So those things were were now beginning to come out that I never knew that were on the inside. And in, in fact, you know, after like six years, I put the first person on the Olympic team, Don Burrell, um, and 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 her brother, of course, Leroy Burrell, held, held the hundred meter dash world record for a little while. And, as she, and she was a soldier athlete, she went to Sydney, Australia. She was the first one, I think, since 1972 that was uh, on the, from from track and field. Uh, so I began doing that. Parallel to that job, I was I started swimming for physical therapy to get myself back in shape. And you're right, I knew nothing about Paralympic Games, even at that time while I was swimming. Um, and my coach, track and field coach, Remy Corchimney, California, he told me he told me about Paralympic sport. And when I researched it, I said, oh, they got swimming. I'm, I'm like seven seconds away from trying to make the 100-meter freestyle. So I hired a coach not to make the team, Chris, just to get my body back in shape. And I, and I had a goal now. I had a target 
that I could just go after. I was not trying to make a Paralympic swim team. Let's get that very clear. As a kid, you started swimming before you started doing anything else, right? Yeah, I, I swam. I played hockey, but you know, it's just in the it's in the tadpole and you know in the YMCA. Uh, and so I I did swim. So I knew how to swim, but not great. I wasn't a like a dynamite swimmer. Um, I was good. I you know I I could beat a lot of folks that were in the in the high schools or in the in the in the grade schools, but I chose other other paths beside that. But I could swim. So yes, I had that background so I could get in the water and go across. But when I got in the water for the first time after the injury, I went 25 meters. I was so out of breath. I I think I drank half the pool, you know, before before I I had to pick I had to teach myself again how to how to do this. Um, and so I just poured every effort so I could get my mind off of the amputation and onto something else and just focus there. And as you said, you know, I went to the Paralympic swim trials and I swam, I remember that I swam, I think 106.01 for the hundred meter freestyle. I needed 106 flat to make the Paralympic standard. And I, I left, <laughs> I, 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 I had done the seven seconds and I was, I was on stat, I was a static, I was on cloud nine. I get back to Catholic, uh, uh, to the world-class athlete program headquarters where I'm about to do my job on Monday morning, phone rings. This guy, Coach Cal from Catholic University, calls me up. He's one of our Paralympic coaches. And he says, why did you leave before the team was announced? And I said, well, sir, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't make it. But, you know, have a great time in Atlanta. You know, really appreciate the, 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 the trials. But I'm, I'm good. You know, I, I can't believe it. I, I shaved seven seconds off my time. And he said, well, one thing in swimming is if you do 100 meters, you do a flip turn at the other end of the pool that flip turn actually counts as a bona fide time. And your flip turn was underneath the Paralympic standard. So we have picked you up for the relay team. <laughs> I said, <laughs> you mean to tell me <laughs> I'm going to the Paralympic games in Atlanta, Georgia as a swimmer. <laughs> right? So it was mind blowing to me, right? It was, I had a, you know, I had a great time there. It was, it was, it was some difficulties around Atlanta, but, um, it was. We were supposed to be there as a hurdler. I was supposed to be there as a, a 400 meter hurdler. And I was there for the Olympic trials watching my athletes. And when I was walking around the top tier to watch the 400 meter hurdles go off, everyone that had, were my peers that were watching that had not made the finals, they called me up to watch it with them. It was, it was surreal. They said, hey, John, come up here with us. And I'm walking around this complex with his one leg because they knew I was on target to be in that final and then here I am going to Atlanta anyway as a swimmer it's, it's just it's too it's too much man it's too much but the Olympic trials were prior to the Paralympic trials I'm assuming so, you, so when you were watching that final of the 400 meters you didn't know that you were going to the Paralympics as a swimmer yeah, did you? No, no, not at all. I, but I wasn't even trying to make the, the team. That's the whole point, right? I wasn't trying. I was not focused on that. I was focused on trying to build my career and, and careers of these other athletes that could could make the, the Olympic Games. And I was I was dawdling in the pool. I was, you know, I was working out. I was doing, you know, what my coach told me to do. And I would work on dry land and do all that stuff. But I wasn't, I had no dreams of making the Paralympic Games. You know, once I found out what they were. The parallel games to the Olympics, I had no, no, not at all. And so when I made it, I was, I was floored, man. I took the rest of the day off. I, I was kind of, it, it, it messed with my mind a little bit. Uh, so, so I had to get myself together. And, uh, and so, but everybody was so supportive. Uh, folks started doing fundraisers, things for me. And, and I got to those games. I saw athletes running and jumping on artificial legs for the first time. And I said, wow, this is, this is a real thing. And, um, and that's when I first, I caught the bug to have an artificial leg made for running, teach myself how to run again. And I figured out after, after three and a half or four years, I could make the Sydney team. And that, that's when I really did put the effort into trying to understand it from the context of everything from running for Arkansas, from running in the, in the army, from, you know, nine time gold medal winner, uh, in all army track and field competition, twice in Olympic trials, I put everything I knew into training for those games for um for sydney uh in in the long jump that's what I, I knew i could do the long jump i didn't think i'd run the 100 meters or the 200 meters because of um amputees there's a there's a there's like subclasses inside of a class it's really difficult to understand but i'm, I'm a true above the knee amputee 
And those individuals that I was running against, running against are through the knee amputees. And so for the audience, one of the things that happens, I'll get a little technical here, is there's only three things that, that you need to, uh, to build speed when you are running, when you ambulate. Uh, the first is you have to have fast turnover. And then secondarily, that turnover has to be a stride frequency and then stride length of the frequency. And then third, because a runner goes up and down, the hips go up and down, uh, when you're going down the track, you need force and power into the ground. And if you have a longer lever, you can apply more force to the ground. And my lever was, uh, I could, I couldn't, I mean, a shorter lever, you can apply more force to the ground. And my lever is too long because I weight bear at my hip and my ischium bone while they were weight bearing at where the knee is. So they could apply more force than I could. Therefore, I had to make up a lot of difference just to try to keep up with those that were through the knees. But in the long jump, I knew technique better than they did. And I figured that was going to be my best shot for, uh, for a medal. So that's how I kind of worked all that. And you'd been an All-American in the long jump as well, right? That's in correct. College. Yeah. Right. So I knew, I knew jumping. I, I knew how to jump. I just had to switch legs. And, you know, <laughs> if my right leg would have been amputated, Lucas Christen would not be the, the, the gold medalist today, today right? <laughs> um, so I had, to, I had to switch. I had to learn how to run. I had to, I had to switch my legs. I had to learn prosthetics. Um, you know, there, there are three things I think that got me silver than, than gold. And I'm not saying I'm not taking anything against Lucas because he's the, he's the champion. And when you're the champion, as you know, uh, it's, it's t- you're not going to just give it away. <laughs> you got to, it's going to be, a, it's going to be a dog fight for, for the top spot. No one's running for the silver medal, but I've learned such, such amazing things because of it and the whole journey. But there are three things that um, I think if I would have known and people would have told me that were blind spots to me may have changed the outcome. One was the first thing I just told you. I'm a through the knee versus, a, uh, I'm, I'm an above the knee rather than a through the knee. So if my doctor would have known about what I would have wanted to do later on in life as an athlete, maybe he would have suggested a through the knee amputation. Maybe I would have heard about Paralympics earlier. And then I would have been able to compete on the level that of those individuals. Secondarily, when I started running with an artificial limb, there is a unit, it's like a cylinder, not anymore, but the, the old, old days of cylinder uh, called a Mauk unit. And that's, that was the, the artificial knee. And I kept blowing those knees out because of a little extension stop, a little piece of metal that stopped the, the leg from going into hyperextension. So because I didn't have that piece, I had to send the leg back or the, the unit back like three times within a four month window. And you know, if you're down in the, in those, in the middle of like before the winter and you're about to, and you're, you're trying to get your, your races in and you, your equipment goes down and you got to keep sending stuff back. How much does that, um, thwart your, your efforts for, from your training? So I had, I had four months of that. Uh, and then the, the thing, the, the final thing was I got to Sydney, Australia and seven days prior to the jump, my, my, the, what my, my competition the prosthetist, the team prosthetist saw I was overpowering the, the, the mouth unit. And he said, well, you just need another mouth unit that has more viscosity. I said, what's that? <laughs> and so he says, well, I, we'll just get you, we'll get you one flown over here and it has higher density oil. So the leg will come back faster. I said, that's a thing. So, cause now I'm going back and when could I, could I have gotten that earlier? So, um, so I'm now, now I'm flying down the runway. I got to change all my steps, all my markings. Uh, and so I'm thankful for it, but it would have been helpful to have that, you know, maybe just three months prior. And I would have been able to, uh, I think I've been able to, to shift faster. I, I'm not, those aren't complaints. They are, they are to say that we have blind spots and we have to get a team around us that can cover our blind spots of the things that we do not know. That's why athletes take feedback very quickly from coaches because coaches can see our blind spots and then we can shift really quick, quickly uh, to, to apply those things so we can have the best performance possible. No, and, and that's that's the intention. And that's the hard part too, because you are a guy who knew track and field. We incidentally did get a, a message from Joe Lamar, your uh, your roommate in Sydney, roommate, who's watching you. So. <laughs> that's my roommate. Exactly. He's a big fan too. So, uh, so, but, but no, I mean, to your point, this is, this is where some of that transition comes in 
Because yes, you say, well, I do know jumping. You know what you need. I went through the same thing in skiing. I felt like I had an advantage over people because I knew what it was supposed to feel like. And when I felt it, I knew I had done it correctly. And then it's a matter of doing it over and over again. And there is that transition because, yeah, you knew jumping, but weren't as fast down the down the runway as you had been. I mean, that's just, that's the way it worked. Works, you were not symmetrical. You said you were jumping off of your your wrong foot in a lot of ways, right? I mean, because you're used to jumping off of your left foot, you're right-handed, right? So it's the whole idea of you're jumping off of your left foot. That's generally the way that it's going. But then you had to effectively go from being right-handed to being left-handed, the ambipedrous uh, side of the world, right? That you were, you had to be able to do both feet, but you also did that in the 400 meters. So you had a little bit going, how did, how did you shape all of that? Because you, you're not, you didn't know everything about the prosthetic side. I mean, this is sort of, I remember doing some paper in high school and it was talking about the people who were, who were landing, who were coming to, to the Northeast, coming to New England and everything they had to have. And they had to be, you know, they had to be farmers and they had to be able to, to, to do their, their mill and they had to be able to effectively do everything. And this is what you're saying as a, as a Paralympic athlete, you had to be able to do everything. How did you shape that? I am one and I learned, I think, I, I believe through the process of going through and understanding when I had the injury that I could not do for myself. There were, there were physical things that I couldn't do and I'll be crass with the audience here. You know, I was so weak that I couldn't even, you know, go to the restroom myself, right? Or have somebody wipe me up. And so with that, there are people that are in your life that are designed, that are there to carry you when you don't know. The challenge is, do we allow them to do that or do we have the pride that says, I'm just going to do it myself. I'm just going to figure it out. I don't want anybody to touch me. You know, as we get age and we get older in life, we see those that struggle with this, who've been in control, who've had, you know, major companies, and now they're the ones that need the assistance, maybe in a, in a nursing facility or assisted living facility, uh, or they've had some type of tra traumatic accident because everybody is temporarily able-bodied, right? No one's, <laughs> everybody's going to come, going to come our way one day, Chris, right? So, um, the, uh, so th and that there's a difficulty there. And so I knew I had to enlist people who knew what to do because I had blind spots. And that's a, uh, that lives with me even to this day. You know, I, I, I do great, a great job speaking, but I hire other people to maybe market or do the financials and stuff. I got to know those things, but that's not my day-to-day -day task. I have them do that. And so I enlisted, I went back to my coach, Coach Remy, because he knows a, co a coach coach and he's, a, he's, got a, he's got an engineering mentality. And it was funny how you said, you know, I wasn't symmetrical. What he did was he put down painter sticks because I wasn't symmetrical running. And he put like, you know, 50 painter sticks and he would separate them like by two, uh, about two, not two or three feet apart. And he said, I want you to run in between these painter sticks and I want you to move your hands like you run. And so uh, like you run with two, two limbs. And I began, he said, don't do anything else. I want you to do this for hundred meters for a month straight. So he could get the rhythm inside of me. And so if you ever watch me on the long jump runway versus everybody else, you will see that I'm more symmetrical than most of the jumpers that are out there because he had the mindset to teach me how to run correctly. I also enlisted a guy named uh, Bob Gailey and taught me within inside of 15 minutes how to run symmetrically as he's a, he's not even an amputee. He's not even a coach for that. He just knows biomechanics, you know, for prosthetics. And uh, so I got with him and he allowed me to, to see how to use power on both sides, you know, equitable or as, as, much, as much equity as I could uh, muster on both sides. So those two gentlemen covered my blind spot so I knew what to do to get the power that I knew previous at Arkansas. 
And it was more, the third thing, Chris, was the wind. I talked to Don Burrell. Remember, I told Don Burrell, I put her on the, on the Olympics. I didn't put her on. She made her own Olympic team. But I gave her the opportunity to, to make the Olympic team and for the world-class athlete program. So I, I said, now I knew I'm going to, to go to Sydney and jump on the same runway that she was on. I said, hey, Don, how was it? What's the, what are the conditions? So now I'm getting all of this information, and she's telling me the wind swirls. It's coming in at about 25, you know, when I was there, 25 to 35 seconds. So now I'm timing on my watch how long 25, 30 seconds is because I know when I get over there and if there's a wind swirl that's going on at about 25, 30 seconds and I have somebody coming up behind me, I'm going to wait for that light to come on before I start up down the long jump runway to have the wind at my back. And then next time the wind's going to be at the face of the other person that comes behind me. So it's all these little things that you, you begin to kind of, um, to open up the aperture because you have help uh, that supports you when you can't support yourself. When did the speaking part of it come in? Because I mean, there's so much of like the athlete part and it's interesting to hear the athlete part of like, okay, this is what's going into being successful. You talked about when you were in Kansas, that you were teaching Bible study and the, 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 the spiritual side for you is something that that's happened through. I mean, your your father was a preacher, right? I mean, this isn't yep. is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so, true. so I mean, that's yeah. So so I mean, there's there's a part of that. Does that does that kind of osmosis? I feel like in some ways, my father was a teacher, uh, and and you know, I mean, he's talking in front of the class all the time, and is great in front of groups and everything. I feel like he, in a lot of ways, enabled me and helped me, and also helped develop a bit of a voice. Is that something that led you to the idea of speaking to, you know, had you thought that you were going to do this before? And it's what you do now. You know, I mean, it's like, who would have imagined sometimes, right? Yeah, no, I don't, I, I think I put myself in positions, you know, how Malcolm Gladwell talks about the 10,000 hours that we, we need. And I was doing those hours without realizing I was doing those hours, right? So I was, for example, I, I played cello, so I was at, at and I was playing on stages. Uh, I sang in choirs. That meant I wasn't on stage. I was reading, you know, liturgy in the, in the church. So I was on, kind of on the stage. So I was always kind of doing it, but I, I wasn't thinking about it as a profession. It wasn't until the world class athlete program, we were down in Houma, Louisiana. I was introducing uh, some military. Uh, athletes to, to tell their stories to these high school kids who generally go off at their sophomore year or junior year and they leave high school and they go to the shrimping boats because that's the family business. So they all start doing that. The recruiters want to get trips and boots so they got to graduate high school and that's what they were focused on. I would do this kind of dog and pony show, show them an artificial leg, tell them a little joke about it or something and then I would introduce the next act. I got back home to Virginia where I was living at the time. Recruiters started calling me and saying, hey, uh, the, the principals of these schools would like for you to come back down. Could you put together like a 35 minute presentation? Now they're no dummies. They wanna be back in the school in front of these kids because that's their, they wanna make their quotas. And I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do that. And then the man said, the recruiter said, well, how much do you charge for that? And I said, I'll get back to you. <laughs> this is where you have to surround yourself with somebody who can, who can uh, help with your blind spots, right? How much do I- you get paid to do this? <laughs> so, so I had a, a, a I remembered vaguely and I called out to California there was a woman on the wall her names and you're going to know this name as soon as I throw it out there and I said I'm going to call out to Tom Goose's office where they did my prosthetic I'm going to talk to Tabby King to see if I can get a hold of this woman and the woman's name is Bonnie St. John sure I've had Bonnie Bonnie's been on here I think she was our third guest Bonnie became my mentor uh, and she poured everything into me about this business. In the in a in a space of three hours, she gave me her contract. She started setting me up how to talk to things. It was she was a godsend. And so when you talk about people that just knew, I hit the jackpot with her. And so I started, I think, ahead of the game a lot further than a lot of other speakers because she helped shorten that learning curve, and I now pay it to others. But for the next until 2012, I really wasn't saying anything. I wouldn't even tell my story. I was telling little quips or something. I would use other anecdotes to try to make the points I wanted to make. So I really wasn't doing justice to anything. 
it wasn't until I joined the National Speakers Association in 2012 that, uh, and I wasn't even joining that for myself. I was actually trying to find a, a, a trainer to come in and train Olympic and Paralympic athletes on how to tell their journey stories with a hook at the end so they could actually make revenue speaking. Because one thing is to tell your story. It's another thing to connect your story. It's another thing to connect your story and have a, an action step that somebody does and it changes their life, right? So there's levels to this thing. I was looking for that. And I found the family. I found a community that always shortens my learning curve. I'm about to head next, you know, next. I won't try to date the show too much. Uh, but I go to a CSP. I'm a CSP now, Certified Speaking Professional. And I, and I have an aperture that's opened up to people who are making, have made empires off of this. So when you talk like the Jim Rohns of the world, when you talk about, uh, um, you know, some, some of the other ones that are out there, I'm trying to think, uh, you know, the Brian Tracy's, the, all these folks were part of this organization and they just pour and they gift into you to help grow your business. That's all it's about. It's growing your speaker business in the professional speaker market. And so I'm in this group of nine individuals next week. It's going to, it's because it's going to be amazing. But um, the speaking when I really got it, uh, I realized I had a platform to shift people to in a, in a 90 minute or 75 to 90 minute keynote where folks said that you can't change anybody's opinion in 90 minutes. I said, I can change it in 45 minutes. So I just because you can't do something as an Olympic athlete, Paralympic athlete, yes, you can. You just have to figure out the, the ways to do it. So I started talking to sports psychologists. I started talking to other psychologists. How do you change people's opinion? How do you unlock and break what's been in their minds for such a long time? And I began to develop a story around this, my own personal kind of personal journey story, which is in the archetype of storytelling is a uh, overcome the monster story. I have some archetypes underneath it, like riches, rags, riches, uh, the quest or the, the journey, voids and return. But my main archetype is um, the overcome the monster. And the monster used to be my leg. I used, that's what I thought. But that's what not, that's not what the monster is. The monster is why I was thinking about it should be my leg. And that opened up because I was now had a contextual model that I could teach other people a process, not the process, but a process to overcome any adversity in their life and explode it. Even during COVID, it exploded because I had a system, I had a process by which I have a process by which uh, to walk somebody through uh, their, their their journey. And so that's not the, so, so you thought it was the leg, but it really was the way that you were thinking about the leg. So the monster was the person that you were seeing in the mirror, ultimately, is what you're talking about. Yeah, or the, oppo the opposing force, right? That's, that's with it and so you know in the, in the contextual model we I, I talk about you talk about like COVID and then and the new normal most people got jaded with the term the new normal I said at the beginning of this podcast that the new normal came from my wife back in 1994 so when people started getting jaded with the term the new normal I've been using the term since 1994 so why were they jaded with this term so I began challenging people and I found that it was in, in one in one of two ways the first way was a past state that was no longer accessible to them and they were felt powerless, a past state that was powerless. And it came out like this, it came out like this. I just wish things would return to normal. Insert that in any challenge we have. I just wish things would go back to normal. We have a regular routine and then a catalytic moment happens and then we just, we don't wanna move forward. We, we want the things to go back the way it used to be. When we graduate from that, that we have graduated what I call the reckoning moment. The next one is a jump. The jump is, a hurdle. Um, the, there are three things that hold us back from the hurdle, from jumping the hurdle. Number one, other people's opinions of us, other people believing for us what we can or cannot do, which is based upon what they believe they could or could not do if they were in our situation. Number two, society, societal norms. What have we looked at? We, we just had Halloween. and Halloween, we see all the, the, the ghouls and goblins, that, and they're all disfigured. They all have crazy looking faces. They all have some type of physical limitation. Captain Hook, even at the earliest ages, he's, a, he's an above the wrist amputee and his arm bit off by Tick Tock the Crocodile. He wears a hook, he wears a claw. We're supposed to be scared of him. He's mysterious. And he and, and so when I go down an aisle and I see an amputee, or I go down the aisle and I see a person using a wheelchair, society has told me to be afraid of them because mom or dad, my authoritarian figure, 
said, when I saw them and I said, hey, mom, look at that person in the wheelchair. Look at that person uh, who's an amputee. They said, Shh, oh, it's impolite to steal. Let's go down a different aisle. So we've just conditioned them to know that this is bad. This is different. We, we don't want to, to be around those type of people. And we buy into it. Because when, uh, when I acquired my disability, I began to think that my wife wouldn't stick around. So that was that part of society was coming in there and I had to break away from that. And the third one is with inside of this, the transformation moment is we have the vision to do it. We don't jump the hurdle. We don't attack the hurdle that's there because we are the one that has to do it. No one else. I don't care how many books you read. You get thousands of books. Books give you a process, maybe a procedure, but they don't jump it for you. I had some of the world's best coaches. You did too. How many coaches ever ran a ski race for you? Went down the mountain for you? How many, how many coaches ran the gates for you? How many coaches? No one. You had to do that. I had to attack my hurdles. And so that's the thing. And that's very hard because sometimes you have to release from your sense of belonging to the others or to society. And then you jump into the new normal mindset. You land at the rebirth. But the rebirth is extremely hard because new actually means no prior point of reference. And because new is no prior point of reference, you now have to use new systems. I didn't know how to really manipulate a wheelchair when I had to get out of, before I got the prosthesis. I didn't know how to wear a prosthesis. I didn't know how to walk. All that stuff was new to me. I had to learn that. I couldn't use old ideas to put into this new mindset. And I challenge anybody, anybody you're out, listeners out there, that if you can go back to the way it used to be, I challenge whether you made a commitment to something or not. You didn't make the commitment. You're probably in the reckoning moment, not in the new normal mindset because that's very difficult. You got to give yourself some space and grace to grow yourself when you were injured, myself when I was injured, we acquired the disability. Those that have a, uh, a disability that was um, congenital, whenever they find that they're now being treated differently because of society because of that, that's when the two worlds converge. And now there's work to be done. I have to learn how to put on a, prosthetic. I have to learn how to walk. I have to learn how to run, jump, all these things. That process for me took seven years to win a medal. And we want it right now. And when we've done the work, that equals our resolve. Is it more challenging for someone who does have a choice? So in some ways, you lost your leg. You, you didn't have, I mean, your choices then were you could get around on crutches with one leg. You could use a wheelchair or you could figure out how to use the prosthetic. The first two choices are nothing similar to what you'd done before. I mean, maybe you'd been on crutches or whatever at some point, but the thing is, is it easier in some ways not having a choice? And, and if, people, if people do have a choice to take this leap that you're talking about to create the new, the new part, how can they, you know, gather, marshal that sense of commitment to be able to say, the old is not what I want to do. I'm severing ties with that, whether it's just in my mind. I mean, obviously, they're not doing it literally, but severing ties. How, how can we do that? Because the change that you're talking about is something that it requires a complete commitment. That's right. And some people won't commit to it. They turn to other things to mask the commitment. Could be alcohol, could be drugs, could be sex, could be whatever. You put whatever you want in, in there or it's just, or in action. And so to answer, you know, in the way I would answer the question is, yes, everybody has either whether, when I, when I snapped my leg in half, that wasn't my choice to do that. It happened. But now I have choices to make because of that. When we went through COVID, for example, everybody, I say, went through a cerebral amputation because one moment you could do everything you wanted to do. The next moment, you couldn't go to the grocery store unless you were wearing a mask and all this stuff. And the people, what they do? They resisted it. They resisted. At least in America, we resisted. We went out and bought toilet paper because <laughs> that was the most rational thing to do in COVID. That was going to solve COVID. So we have these panicked ideas and panicked things because we don't, we, we don't want to change. We want it kind of done like Birkin. We want it our way. And it's very difficult. That's why, I, that's why I do the work in those two areas of the jump and in the rebirth. Because everything else is, you know, 
everything else is has a system or process that we can do. We can identify where we are. But the two hardest things to do are for people to make those commitments. Uh, and that, I, I'm, I'm telling you, it, people gloss over these things. And it's, it's, it's where it, it, it's the difference between being on the metal podium and being at the games and not having made your team. It's, it's that serious. It's a, and I, I'll, tell, I'll tell people after a presentation, Chris, I'll say, look, this stuff is hard. It's not easy. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. You, it's, it's, it's about hard work <laughs> because we've known people that work hard and have everything. We know, also know people that work hard and don't have anything. We know people that have been lazy and have everything and people who are lazy and have nothing. So it's not about hard work. It's about the opportunity connected to that work. It's about the choice that you made to of what you're planting into that ground to grow a harvest and a seed, a uh, harvest seed uh, 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 after you. And so when I talk to organizations now and I say at the end of the presentation, if I'm a closing speaker, for example, and I'll say, look, you've, you've, you've been here for two to three days. How many are about to get on, on a flight right now instead of taking another day here and synthesizing all the information that you've learned? You know, all the, all, I see all the bags in the back of the room. I said, what, what were you here to do? And the second there, I, I say, uh, you know that you had one great idea. So tomorrow I want you to take one step toward that idea. And I, want, I do not want you to hold yourself accountable to it. By 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, you'll do this. And you're not going to hold yourself accountable. You're actually going to find somebody at your table or in this room, and you're going to get their telephone number, and you're going to call them at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, your time, and you're going to just tell them if you made progress, one-step progress on your goal or not. And then after you do that, here's my email ad address, john at johnregister.com. And if there's a 1,000 people in the room, I'll say, here's, here's, here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you this right now. I will hear from about three of you. <laughs> Those are going to be the A-listers, the A-plus-plusers, the, the, the real ones, the real go-getters. And I can tell you this right now, and I still will get three people that will do it. And I, then I put those three into like maybe a little coaching session afterwards because they made, they're they the ones that are going to make the commitment. I'm not going to just do for anybody that says, hey, I want to do this. No, you're not going to do it. So I'm not going to spend my time with you until you prove to me that you are ready, willing, and you're gonna, you're hungry for this thing. And so that is, that's the challenge. We want people to do things for us when we are responsible for taking, what I call taking power. Even when I talk with persons with disabilities, I was over in Ethiopia a few hours ago. Uh, and, you know, folks are looking for, you know, we want pro our programs to be supported. So we look for funding and all these things. I said, shift it. Go after it. We have, I, I can't show you my cell phone because I'm using it. But we got the cell phone. Everybody that's on the street right there that was at least, that I saw about 80% of the people, they all had a phone. So that means that phone is no longer the phone you talk on, it's commerce. I make money on this phone because I do these videos on my phone. And then I, I set up a commerce on the phone and I can do everything with this phone. So no longer do I need to, to have somebody come to me and so there was a dance, a, a guy in Ethiopia, a, a dance crew, and they, they wanted some funding to, to support them to go around doing their dance crew. I said, have you ever heard of TikTok? <laughs> so he's like, yeah. I said, why aren't you on TikTok? Why aren't you putting the, mark, the, the people that you want to see you dance and tag them on TikTok? It'll go a lot faster. So we just got to think things differently. I mean, so much of what you do now is you're in front of groups, you're talking to groups, you're helping people, you're coaching. What's your hurdle right now? Because these things don't stop, do they? Right. What's your hurdle? My, my Achilles heel is I get uh, frustrated when people don't commit to the dream, the vision that they know they have to do. What about you, though? I mean, not, not, not them. Yeah. Uh, I think my, my hurdle right now is, is managing. Um, the challenge I have right now is my discovery around. Uh, I th I'm trying to think of it because I'm, I'm now the CEO of the, of the acting CEO of the amputee coalition. I've been learning a lot about myself. And one, one of the things that is another killing seal for me right now, for, for me in life, I didn't really realize this is I do not like confrontation. <laughs> I, I loathe it. I don't, I don't like it. I'll do it, but I don't, I don't like it. And I've been able to kind of understand that about myself. 
I've also been, I had to understand that I didn't do a great job of protecting my boundaries. Haven't, haven't done that in the past. So I've been saying kind of yes to a lot of folks. And when my wife went down with COVID uh, and we almost lost her, we almost lost Alice, uh, I, I, tr I went from saying I was a family man to actually being one. And so I say no to a lot more things now uh, to be with her uh, uh, during this, this specific time. And so those have been things that have really helped me uh, grow. And that has offered, gotten me to have be more empathetic on the things for, like I was saying earlier, with other individuals that won't commit when they, when they know they need to commit. So I'm more empathetic because of the things I, I'm going through right now. And the fact of the matter is it, it, it gets boring if there's nothing to do, right? I mean, this is back to you getting in the swimming pool and looking for seven seconds. Those seven, seven seconds were representative of your improvement which is the most intoxicating thing as a human being, right? If you are improving, you're going to keep coming back. But if you stop improving, you get stagnant, then you effectively start dying in a lot of ways, right? I mean, you're not, you're not really living anymore. So, so this, is, this is where even though you're imparting so much knowledge to so many people, it's great to see that you continue to be on this journey, because if you're not, you're effectively, if you're not struggling, you're not human anymore. Absolutely. Yeah, there was a, a, a gentleman I've been, uh, I coach, I, I don't think it's, the teacher becomes the, the, the what's, it, what's it called? The, the student becomes a teacher. Uh, so he started his speaking career. He's he's off and rocking it right now. And so I coached him a little bit on how to, you know, get to his, his journey story. And he was uh, concerned because he was a, a heavy pilot, right? So he's flying cargoes for the Air Force. Uh, and he's still, he was still in the Air Force, and then he's flying also for another major airline company. And so his, his challenge was he said, you know, I'm not a fighter pilot. I don't have that sexy story. I said, you don't need that story. I said, everybody that's, that's a fighter pilot, that speaker out there right now, they're talking about a past experience. They're no longer in that cockpit. They are no longer of the dials, of the controls. So they're, they're talking about something that's past. What if I came every day to the to the to give my speech and all I did was talk about winning the silver medal? That's not helping anybody because that's a past performance. It can show you a time continuum of what's gone on in my life, but it does not show you the progression that we have done afterwards. It doesn't say building the military sport program. Does it? It doesn't talk about you know getting Prince Harry to come over and, and build Invictus Games with that. It doesn't talk about some of the other things that are that are going on. Uh, in life, as we continue, as you said, to progress, the the Olympic motto, uh, the Latin words are citius, altius, fortius, which, when translated into English, are swifter, higher, and stronger. Those words are not written in the superlative of the word. It's not the highest form of the word. It's not swiftest, highest, or strongest. They're written with this er stem ending, that we can be the swiftest today. You know what? I can be swifter tomorrow. I can jump the highest today. I can jump higher tomorrow. I can lift the heaviest weight today. I can lift heavier weights tomorrow. So you're exactly right. The new normal for me is not a destination. It's a plateau by which we grow. It's always a growth mindset. And it's layered in that contextual model because I might be the new normal mindset in my finances, but I might be at the, the, the point of reckoning, <coughs> excuse me, in my faith or in my sports or in whatever my other might be. So it's all layered. Or your human interaction, right? If, if you're talking about avoiding conflict, which I mean, I'm pretty good at avoiding conflict as well. So I'm not, I hate it, not man. giving That's... a hard time there. <laughs> oh, you can. Because I, you know, I, I, I recognize it. And I think, you know, this, this, this challenge that I have with the Amputee Coalition was to put me in conflict situations for something else that might be coming up. So I'm better at dealing with it now, but I still don't like it. You know, I recognize that about myself. Uh, and that's, you know, that's half the battle, right? You got to recognize where you are. Um, and so I, that's, a, that's a weakness I have. So, yeah. Well, John, we're going to have to get you out of here because, uh, because you, I, I can't imagine, you probably haven't slept in a long period of time and you still have to get up to Brackenridge. So you might have some dicey roads in between where you are and where you need to go. But thank you so much for, for sharing all of, all of your knowledge and uh, for sharing with our group. We really appreciate it. Oh, I, I appreciate it, Chris. Uh, you you do fantastic work. I love following you. Uh, uh, just just you're such a great representative, and and you always you know are giving back. So thank you for the opportunity to be on your show. This is wonderful. I appreciate it. We'll do it again. Uh, thank you to all of you for tuning in. 
We are so grateful for you to tune in. The greatest gift, as we say, is tell your friends. Please tell your friends to tune in. Please follow us. Please like us when this becomes a regular podcast. And we will be committed to bringing you great content in the future. Mm -hmm.